So everything from this point in is being recorded. So, hello everyone and welcome to another past webinar from the Professional Development Virtual Chapter. Today we have a new session that's going to be presented to you by Kenny. I'll introduce Kenny shortly. Before I do so, it's going to go through some housekeeping items for you. So, the controls for GoToWebinar are probably on the right-hand side of your screen and you can open and you can minimize those. If you have a question you'd like to post today please go to the question section and type in there's no audio for the audience so you need to type in your questions we will then relay those questions to Kenny and Kenny will be able to answer those either during the session or following the session at the end when we uh, tidy up any questions that haven't been taken so that's the uh, controls if you do have any difficulty uh, there is also a way of showing uh, and raising your hands for the controls to get some attention that you may have some issues uh, that we can help with. So let me go on to the community news. So PASS is an organization, as you're probably aware, where it's volunteered, volunteer led. So all of the volunteers uh, run the chapters, virtual chapters, and also the physical chapters and SQL Saturdays as well. So we're going to go through some community news here for you. So first off, to make you aware of the past elections. You may have been aware that there's a recently a non-con where we elected several individuals to, to serve on the nomination committee board along with some of the additional um, kind of past members that actually are on the board to look at over overview of the elections and look at who's actually being put their name forward for the election. So that's actually going to be held slightly later in the year. In order for you to vote, you must have a updated eligible pass completed my pass profile for the 1st of June 2016. So please make sure that you, if you want to vote, that you go on and you update that and it will actually identify you that you actually have a eligibility to vote. And they will take place in September and there's more information going to come out for the campaigns in the next coming months. You're probably also aware that we also have a large uh, kind of conference that's happening in May, the Business Analytics Conference, and there's a number of key speakers. Some of those have now been announced, and this is focused around the kind of visualization aspects of our industry. So Power BI, Excel, Big Data, and kind of all the visualization aspects. So if you may be attending that, all the details for passbaconference.com. You can register. If you need some Discount codes, they are available and we can make those uh, give you a little bit of discount from the ticket price. 
as I said earlier, past virtual chapters, there's many of them. This is just one. And you're able to subscribe and register to those and also get notifications about the upcoming events along with visiting the sequelpast.org website. And also slash VC is the quick link to get to the virtual chat section there. Here's a quick listing of some of the virtual chapters that are happening in May, uh, sorry, April. And you can see there's already a few of those that we kind of have uh, just gone by. But we have um, obviously some more later on during the April event. And as I say, just go to sequelpast.org events. You can see all the events that are happening for the past organizations. There's a number of SQL Saturdays that actually are also happening both in North America and internationally. And these are the ones, or some of the ones for April, that have uh, yet to be done. So we've got some this coming weekend, both international and North America, and some the following weekend after that. And I think there's some, there's a load more in May as well coming. So again, SQLSaturday.com is your website you need to attend to register for those events. They are free on the Saturday. And there's also probably a large number of them have pre-cons, which are one-day events, usually that proceed on the Friday that will allow you to kind of get a bit more in depth with a specific presenter, a specific topic. So again, you can find those details on the website. As I said earlier, you know, we are a completely volunteer-led organization. So really without the volunteers, we wouldn't be able to function and we won't be able to put these events on. So please, if you do have that volunteer hat, earn, you know, urge, go to volunteer.sequelpass.org and register for the things that interest you, what the activities you'd like to do. And from there, we can kind of hook you up the right local chapter and virtual chapter leaders that we're able to help you kind of uh, you know, take on some um, activities around volunteering there. And finally, you know, stay involved. Twitter is a, is a great way to kind of communicate with others, but also we have LinkedIn, Facebook. And if you haven't visited recently the sequelpass.org website, do go on. It has a lot of information. There's previous videos of recording sessions from previous past summits and other events like 24 Hours of Past, for example. So you have a lot of resources available to you that you may not be aware of. And, and you'll find those by just kind of having to spend a little bit of time on the website. So finally, here's a few virtual chapter ones. We have uh, some the virtualization, we have the women technology ones, there's a number of uh, language ones like Italian there, for example, and Persian. And, you know, there's some later in the month around data architecture. So there's going to be something for everyone. Please just go and have a look and see something you'd like. Remember, these are probably recorded. So you will be able to look at these later on and look at past recordings like we have for this chapter. We have our past recordings or some of those listed on our YouTube channel as well. So that's really it for me today. I'm not here to uh, do the presentation. I'm going to pass the reins over to Kenny. I'm going to bring him on the mic so he can introduce himself and also um, change presenter. So let me just do that. So Kenny, you should now have the controls and reins for the session. And we can see that. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to you and off you go. Sorry, I, I muted you for a second. Please, uh, please go ahead now. Um, that's fine. Thank you so much for having me um, for this uh, presentation on how to build an IT operations expert. Steve. So this is me, uh, Kenny Nubo Pantopidan. Um, I have a blog, I have a Twitter account, and an email if you're interested in, in uh, getting in touch. Um, I used to be a mathematician, uh, then I worked through uh, IT in my first IT job in a bank, um, worked in IT security, uh, studied computer science at the University of Queensland in Australia, um, and then I uh, got a job at IT University of Copenhagen. I worked at uh, Statistics Denmark, uh, then on to consulting at a uh, Danish uh, database consultancy company called Miracle, and then 
for the last more than five years, I've been working as partly as a BI consultant, but also as at, and the head of R&D and uh, product owner of, of our product for self-service data warehousing. Um, English is not my uh, my first language, so bear with me if I if I speak in odd words and things like that. So. I uh, chose uh, he or she for for any any stories. I flipped a coin and she won. So any any stories I tell you uh, will will be with a, with a she. Then maybe some of the pictures are actually with a he, but I think we can relate to that anyway. Okay, so this uh, this presentation uh, is about this strange feeling. So this strange feeling, uh, we as professionals probably had a couple of times in our career. So you're sitting with some really good, say, system administrator, but it could be any any skill really. And suddenly you feel, you get this feeling that there's something magical going on right now. Something that that person cannot really explain why she is doing what she is doing. It just feels right for her to try just this thing. And uh, yeah, and then she, she, start, she says something about, yeah, I, I tried something similar five years back. Now it's not quite the same because it was on Linux and yeah, it was in a different language and the database was Oracle, but still it's kind of, it felt like, uh, like, like the same situation. So if you've ever tried to have to, to that feeling, this is this is what this uh, this investigation or this research project I uh, I did, uh, what kicked it off. So it's it all started um, at an agile uh, development conference back in 2007. I uh, just like the SQL Saturday precons. This press, this conference also had uh, precons on various topics, and one of the precons uh, was led by a guy called Andy Hunt or Andrew Hunt. Um, Andrew Hunt is the author or co-author of a very influential book on programming called The Pragmatic Programmer, and I put in the reference uh, to your right here in this slide. Um, if you don't know that book, and if you have anything to do with programming, go and get get yourself one. Uh, they're not they're not very expensive on whatever Amazon you're using. Uh, go and get it and read it. If you are an experienced programmer, uh, get one and read it every year from now on. It's there's lots of good stuff in there. Now. Mr. Andrew Hunt um, at, at the time was researching material for his new book, um, this, this book on your left, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning, and he was trying out the material uh, on, on the audience of this pre-con. And one of the things he was, he, was, uh, he, he was talking about was, and I can also highly recommend uh, this book, Uh, to work with professional development of yourself and others. Um, that's a, that's a, l a lot of, of gold nuggets in that one as well. Now, Andrew Hunt was presenting uh, a lot of things during that day from the book. And one of the things he was presenting was, um, was this, this, this thing about intuition and uh, that, that situation I described. Um, and he was talking about P Patricia Benner and uh, the Dreyfus and Dreyfus export, expert model. Uh, and I will, um, I will get back to that uh, during this presentation. I was listening to this, uh, this all this uh, he was telling about. And, uh, and by the time I was also studying for a an, an, an degree in IT management here at, at, at University of Copenhagen, or oh, uh, IT University of Copenhagen, sorry. Um, and I was, I, I was looking for a thesis, um, uh, a subject uh, for, my, for my master thesis. Um, and, um, and that's what really started this journey for me with the Dreyfus and Dreyfus expert model and also um, how to apply that in, within IT operations. 
by the time I was working in the IT department uh, at, at the IT University of Copenhagen, even I was working as a developer, but uh, but I was working uh, with uh, system administrators in the, in the same department. And I had this, I had this sometimes this feeling about uh, about magic going on uh, when I was troubleshooting, when especially with one of them. Um, so. Well, at the time when I needed to write this thesis, uh, I put up um, two research main research questions. That's what you need to do when you when you do an academic paper like that. And uh, and research question number one was, um, sorry, what what is it that makes the difference between a normal IT operations employee just that that normal guy that uh, does his uh, that uh, that does his job and and um, and it's okay and uh, I mean everything is fine and then that expert that uh, where where she is really just in a, in a different world in a different league what what's what's what is that difference between with between these two um, personalities or uh, or different competences. So that was the first thing. Try to understand that uh, the the expertise uh, within IT operations. The second research question was uh, if you are if, because this was a degree in in IT management. Uh, I would also like to have uh, to see if if I could do some research that could help IT managers um, making their uh, their professional development better. So the second research question was, from the perspective of a manager of an IT operations department or team, you want to know uh, how can you, how can you, what can you do about uh, the competences of your normal IT operations employees and, and can you make them more expert-like? And uh, so that's one thing. You want to, to improve on, on, on the non-experts to make them more expert-like. And the second question was, how if if you are if we are lucky enough to have uh, uh, these experts, what can we do to keep them sharp and happy? Um, what uh, so 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 make sure that they they are still interested in working uh, in our company and in our in our department. So that's that's what I set out to uh, to investigate. Um, one reason I'm I'm very happy to present to to this group is that this this is research that has never been done in the world before. Um, so this no one had had have had any interested interest in 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 understanding expertise within IT operations people. Uh, there was a little bit of effort in understanding expertise within programmers. But but no one in operations probably because operations, as we all know, these are the guys that we lock in the basement. And you know, if if things are running smooth, uh, everything is fine. And if 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 and we only kind of think of them if if things are not. Okay, so um, so the the journey about understanding expertise uh, was. Uh, uh, or the theory that I chose to uh, to to um, to look at expertise uh, within IT operations uh, is the Dreyfus and Dreyfus expert model. Um, this this model uh, and this this is not a model like in machine learning model. This is not it's it's not even a model in the in the Harvard Business Review sense of a model uh, with with the matrix. The Dreyfus and Dreyfus expert model um, is, is, uh, was discovered or described by two brothers, Stuart and Hubert Dreyfus. Um, one of them uh, was a psychologist and one of them was working in, within operations research. Operations research is a field in applied mathematics. Um, and what they set out to understand was emergency Response behavior for fighter pilots, or air, well, it was I, I believe it was uh, fighter pilots, um, and the the this, the funding for this research, uh, as you can see here, I think so. Well, maybe 
no, not in this one. Well, maybe there's, a, there's another version that the, the first version of the research, I, I believe, was two years earlier. Um, it was funded by the military in the U.S. Um, and uh, but they, they, the, the military are probably the, the uh, guys with the aircraft, uh, not Navy, but uh, Air Force. The Air Force wanted to understand if they could train emergency response behavior and if they could make uh, pilots better at this. Think about if you are if you are sitting flying in a in a fighter fighter um, in a in a, in a if you are a fighter pilot, um, it would be nice that if you do emergency uh, response uh, actions that you're not, one, losing the plane, and two, that you're not uh, losing the pilot. Both of them are not good. Um, during this research, um, the, the, the Dreyfus brothers uh, described um, this uh, expert model uh, Dreyfus and Dreyfus expert model as a way to try to understand competences. So the model is 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 describing a competence in different levels. So you should not think about uh, that you are you are an expert as a person, but you should think of of these uh, are different levels on a given expertise or a given competence. Um, and let me try to explain. Uh, the model in uh, with some examples. So on the first level, when you are a novice, you are fresh. You are fresh out of school, and you have no experience. You have no experience with this competence. Now, if with without any experience, you would you need some kind of rules to take uh, decisions upon. Um, and and when you don't have any experience, these rules. Need, I mean, they are context-free. They they cannot have any uh, any uh, relationship with the with the given context you are operating in when you're solving a problem. So so these are kind of just general rules, and you're following these rules. Um, so an example here, and this is where oh yeah, I, I guess the novice can be a he, so that's okay. So here's an example from a, a call center, a support center, and you have a user calling in. And uh, and he is he is actually uh, using a Mac, but but uh, but the script tells this support person that he's uh, he he needs to ask this user to press the Windows Windows button in order to to complete. And this is totally out of context. Um, so this is a context-free rule, right? Now, when you step up to the next level in the Dreyfus and Dreyfus uh, expert model. You, you get to the advanced beginner. And uh, so this is the name of, of the level. And as an, an advanced beginner, uh, as an advanced beginner in a given competence, you recognize features in the situation. So you, you start with, you, you're getting some, some experience within this uh, field or in this uh, competence. And you start expand the set of context-free rules with rules based on elements from the situation. So if we go back to our call center, uh, after some uh, bad experiences, uh, our poor guy uh, was uh, yelled at and other things uh, by Mac, Mac users. We know that sometime he asks, starts to ask the user, what's your OS? What Are, are you using a Mac or are you using Windows uh, in, the begin, in the beginning of this uh, support call? And this doesn't have to necessarily uh, the script, the support, uh, the, the call center uh, might still have the same scripts that you need to follow this and this and this. But, but now this person um, on on the uh, advanced beginner level, uh, will then use his experience uh, to to at least have some kind of context and put some elements of previous experience into uh, into the situation. Then he can follow the Mac specific guide. Okay. On the on the third level, uh, you, we we talk about uh, that you are competent on this given. Uh, expertise or competence. So still, you're not a competent person. You are competent within the, this area. 
on the competent level, uh, people start using what's uh, in with fine words called hierarchical decision procedures or making plans. So on on the competent level, you choose a number of relevant elements from the situation, then you make a plan, and then you stick to the plan. So in a troubleshooting situation, there's a changed configuration and now you have an error. So the set of these set of elements, uh, they could be, what did we change? And uh, the, an example of a plan could be, let's revert all changes, and then for each thing that we changed, enable it, and then until we see the error, and then we know which change actually um, um, gave that error. Now, but this, uh, and, and, and the reason why we are still not experts here is that we are not, we're sticking to the plan, we are not considering if, if, if the actual things changed could have, could have caused uh, uh, that symptom. So we are still, we are still using our experience, but we are also still in the, in a context, uh, still kind of in the, in the, not in the in the in the expertise where where magic happens. This is uh, where where we, when we get to level four, the proficient level. This is where magic starts to happen. So the pro the, the proficient user, or the proficient at this level, you start using maxims to guide you, and a maxim is a, an expression of general truth or principle or principle of rule or conduct. And with, that, with, with other words, it's these really annoying things that, uh, that people of, of old age will tell us and then expect us to, uh, to get some wisdom out of. Let me give you an example. So from extreme programming, uh, we have a couple of maxims called uh, simplest thing that could possibly work. Really annoying thing uh, when, you, uh, when you haven't really uh, have had any experience, then what could, what could possibly work? That kind of, this is, this is a, a, a really nice maxim if you, if you have worked uh, a couple or five or 10 years in industry because now you've seen what could go wrong, what, what was too complicated, was what was too simple, and then finding maybe not the sweet spot in between, but some still some good solution in between that could work and that's still not overcomplicated um, and, and still not too simple to actually work. Another example of a maxim could be this really annoying thing of test everything that could break. So that's still for, for, an, for a novice, uh, complete, uh, cannot say that word online, but uh, it, something where you, you don't really know what, what that means. In IT operations, it's, it's fairly common to have automate, and automate everything is probably not a good maxim, but, uh, but automate uh, most things or automate the things that should be auto automated. Also examples of maxims uh, that are really annoying to be uh, presented to if, if, if you haven't had some, at least some or maybe a lot of experience within IT operations. Now, the proficient on this level, uh, then it, a person uh, on this level for a competence uses these maxims to organize and understand a problem in an intuitive way. And this is also the first place or the first level where intuition is actually being used in the model. So try to use maxims and, uh, and intuition to understand the problem. And then use maybe the other side of the brain, uh, the, the, right, the left side of the brain, to, to, uh, to actually analyze the this, this situation from this, this and find out how to solve it. Now, intuition 
in the Dreyfus and Dreyfus definition. Uh, this is uh, the book they wrote later on uh, on their work, um, the Mind Over Machine. It's not really you can buy it on Amazon for a dollar, uh, but I would uh, if you do that, please just uh, read the first or two chapters, um, and uh, I would probably suggest that you you buy Andy Hunt's book and then just read the chapter there. But it's in there. Intuition, the definition of intuition for drivers and drivers, is that understanding or the understanding that effortlessly occurs upon seeing similarities with previous experience. This effortlessly, this, this is where, where that pattern matching uh, right hand side of your brain goes in and, and simply scans your full life experience and then match that to this problem you have. And this is, this is the intuition, going back to the example from the, the beginning of the talk, that, th that expert where she said, yeah, it's not, it was on Linux, it was on Oracle, and, uh, but, but still it, it felt like the same kind of problem. This is the pattern matching and this, this comes from intuition. So, the proficient uh, on the proficient level, in, instead of using rules on the first driver's levels, uh, these maxims, you can think of these maxims as rules, but they're very weak. Or they, these are rules that need to be fed context in order to make sense. And that's why we, we could also call maxims rules interpreted in a context. So, to make this more concrete, if we take the maxim, test everything that could break. A beginner might say, but what exactly do I need to test? Because if you don't have any experience or only a little bit of experience, there's just so much. There's the, the amount of code, the amount of, of screens or ways to test is simply overwhelming. But on the proficient level, a person will, she will look at the, this situation and she might say something like, yeah, but we, of course, we shouldn't test inside the libraries that we acquired or we downloaded the open source libraries or we should not test within these because they have hopefully been tested uh, by the people developing them. What we should test is probably the integration points between uh, these um, between these uh, modules or these uh, com components. So, so and and that's something you can only get from experience because every one of us have probably written uh, very big test suites. If you at least if you are a developer or former developer like like me, that extensive test suites of things that are really obvious and probably was just uh, redundant in, in so many ways to write these tests and that time was wasted uh, instead of being used for, for something uh, relevant instead. There's one more level from the Dreyfus and Dreyfus, uh, the expert or master. Um, I, I must say that, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, you can read my thesis uh, if you can read Danish it's it's right there it might even be that IT University of Copenhagen um, put down that website uh, but uh, send me a tweet and uh, if you can probably get some funny things out of putting that through Google Translate but the thing I'm going to talk to tell you about today are really what's in that thesis um, and it was inspired by, by the talk by Andy Hunt while not only did he introduce the idea of the Dreyfus and Dreyfus model that I have explained to you, but he also uh, told the story about this woman, Patricia Benner. Now Patricia Benner is a, is a hero within nursing, uh, nursing schools. Um, she took the Dreyfus and Dreyfus model um, into her work or into
her researching in, in, in trying to understand uh, expertise within nursing. And this was also what inspired me to say, well, if if Patricia Benner can take this theory and apply it to something like how do nurses get this intuition of going in and check on a patient one more time because there was just something wrong, something smelled wrong, not in a physical way, but there was something odd. And I, I thought, well, that's the same experience I had with IT operations people. They also had this, they could had this sense of smell. Okay, so Patricia Benner had a huge influence on on nursing education, uh, at least in the US, uh, a little bit here in Denmark, probably also around the world. Uh, this website, I took uh, this information from uh, if, uh, novice to expert, which is, she is not. She is influenced by, or she took the drivers and drivers model and apply it, applied it, but she did not invent uh, the model or the, the terms. But she worked so much with it to describe nursing expertise that the nursing community uh, thinks it, she invented that as well. From her work, uh, she, um, she came with some experience, um, or she had some findings in her research that I thought was interesting to to take uh, on, uh, and and try to also use these experiences as um, also guiding lines for how to do uh, professional development in this other field. One of the things Patricia Benner uh, found out was that if you want to to create knowledge sharing groups, you need to make them along the driver scale. And what do I mean by that? Well, if, if we take the scale and turn it uh, 90 degrees, so the novice level is on your right here, and the advanced beginner, the competent, the, uh, um, or all the way up to the expert. Um, you need, if, if you have, if you want people to really study together and learn together, they need to do it on the same level. So knowledge sharing is, is working best if, if you are kind of on the same level. So um, that was one thing she, she found out. One, thing, one other thing she found out was if you want to do mentoring, uh, if you want to make, create uh, mentoring pairs between individuals, uh, it's good to have them where they gap uh, uh, the competence levels, but don't make the gaps too wide. So if you have a true expert, you should not have this person to be a mentor of a novice. And the reason for this is that simply they don't understand each other anymore on this, I mean, not as people, but on this given competence. So if you want to if you want to, so so the expert will be blubbing about these maxims way of of, um, of 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 learning, and the novice will simply not appreciate that and will not understand that. Um, and the expert has probably been in this field too long to remember what it was like to be the novice. So it's a it's also a waste of time for the experts to, to spend his time on the novice, or actually on the organization, you should spend the experts' time wisely and make the experts mentors for the competent, because the competent is, is, is the, on the competence level, or the competent level, this is the first time where you are you're able to use intuition, or at least to get this, uh, get away from the, from the scripting. So, so the experience from Banner that I think we can also transfer to many other uh, uh, areas is make sure you make the mentor pairs uh, not too wide and don't let people mentor each other on, uh, on, on the same level. Um, so my, uh, 
the, the way I uh, did my uh, research was I conducted four qualitative interviews. Um, they are so these interviews are uh, so so even though it's 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 in the uh, humanistic area, I guess you can say. Uh, they were still very uh, controlled and, and planned, so it, it was, um, and I'm not going to, into details about that, but if um, any of you need to do any qualitative research, I can definitely recommend um, some books on that. And then I did a questionnaire um, for a different IT department, and I chose uh, five different IT departments. Um, uh, tried to, to have uh, both small and big organizations, both public and private sector, and both uh, and 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 also both in the capital region and in Jutland, which is uh, out, a region outside uh, of of the capital of Denmark. I um, one more thing with the question is, in order to get a high response rate. I didn't do web-based, so I printed uh, the questionnaires out on paper, and I, and I physically went to the IT departments uh, when they had their weekly or bi-weekly department meeting. I uh, I had an appointment with the with the head of of department that I it was okay for them to fill in the questionnaire uh, while it was there, and then uh, I actually got. Um, a percentage of, uh, of people answering uh, around uh, more than 80% or 85% or something like that. Okay, so, so here are some statistics of, uh, of IT operations um, uh, age in uh, at least uh, the, the five different departments that I visited. We can see uh, a few things from, uh, from the distribution. First of all, we are not talking about uh, people who are fresh out of school. So, uh, in in all the the five departments, uh, I think uh, around 100 people. Uh, only one was uh, at the age of 25, and uh, and the rest was uh, was in what you probably could call the mature, uh, or at least uh, with it. Well, I guess within IT, you are mature when you're after when you're older than 30. Um, some people told me later that uh, that or, and, and that goes uh, for myself as well that they started as developers and then later on in life they uh, took an interest in IT operations and maybe this is what we can see from the distribution of age. Um, this is partly supported by the experience in years. Um, we can also see that uh, the the amount of people in the low end of experience, uh, that's not a lot. And then uh, there's uh, quite a few in the range between 10 and 15 years. And and there was even one uh, 40, with 42 years of experience, quite a feat. The educational background, um, as we can see here, is uh, distri distributed, or at least in Denmark, maybe that's a cultural, cultural thing. Uh, is uh, most people are uh, having a short uh, to middle, long, a long education. Not not a lot of people uh, graduating high school or uh, had or elementary school and then go into this this field, um, which which was actually surprising to me. That uh, that it was distributed like this. I th thought that uh, I would see more high school dropouts in within IT operations, but I didn't. Some of the char characteristics uh, when I analyzed the, the interview texts was um, that I could I could s s recognize features from the drivers and drivers. Um, what I asked the interviewees to do was to recall situations where they had been a novice and had also uh, tell me a story about, uh, sorry, um, 
I need to get the webcam off. And also tell, tell stories when they were expert. Uh, Non-expert stories, there were lots of talks or, or history, a uh, story, story about procedures, uh, having, having procedures, no use of intuition, uh, and they needed to ask people with experience and they didn't have a lot of education in what they were doing. In the expert situations, they were describing hard problems, they were engaged, they uh, were talking about experience and intuition and also reflection on, uh, on what they did. So there was a lot of reflection afterwards uh, why this succeeded uh, in when, when they had this expert experience. Um, during the interviews, the, these experts were also asked, asked about uh, the preferences for learning methods, how they liked to learn things, you could also have negative scores. Um, what uh, the, the number says is this, that there are, at least for the interviews I did, was uh, something that people rated as something that was very um, attractive. First of all, on-the-job training, help a colleague, and reflection. All of these three was uh, methods that were attractive to experts in how, how to learn things. And uh, if you go down and see courses, that's three uh, academic courses, a zero vendor courses, even a minus five. So it seems like the, the, the experts, um, that, that if you want to help your experts, uh, you should not give them vendor courses uh, or courses, but you should uh, you should cater for on-the-job training uh, and and mentoring and being able to reflect on practices. Importance of different activities to develop IT-related experience. This was from the questionnaire, so this is broadly around the 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 different um, experiences. There are uh, five, uh, so statistically significant five different activities that uh, that uh, that we can see from the graph. Um, one of them is one of them is uh, courses. Uh, the second one was search the internet. The third one was work together with more experienced people. Uh, the fourth, solve problems in daily work, and the fifth one was speak with colleagues. So these were important uh, tasks to be able to develop as a, within IT-related exp expertise. So some findings uh, from the research for all um, for all uh, all people was that uh, because I also uh, um, took the population uh, of the, of, I separated the, the population from the questionnaires into two, uh, people with no or short education and people with uh, middle, long to long education. And what I found out was that people with no or short education uh, preferred courses compared with people with middle or, or long education. And this could be seen from the data and, uh, and t-tests uh, showed a significant difference uh, in, in this. The second finding I, I could see from uh, the data was that, um, or maybe not from the data, but if, if you believe in the Dreyfus and Dreyfus methodology, then if, if you keep on putting your employees on new tasks where they are, where they are beginners, and you also let keep them operate on the lower drivers levels and you'll never let them get the experience they need to be able to act on the expert levels so so moving around people all the time is actually forcing them to stay on the lower levels of the drivers and drivers uh, uh, model uh, one more finding uh, was that the experts um, if you uh, use your experts as mentors, um, then you might need to help them be a good mentor because the expert model is, is on competences and even though you are a great database administrator, it doesn't necessarily make you a great mentor. 
So, um, so that's uh, something to uh, to bear in mind if you want to work with mentoring as a as a as a way of developing your employees. Uh, you might need to help your experts uh, be better mentors. Um, one thing that I've, what came out from the, the interviews with the experts is that experts actually don't learn uh, a lot from or don't didn't say anything say well they said explicitly that they didn't learn from role models or mentors and they also uh, thought that vendor courses uh, was a waste of time and finally uh, the uh, for the experts um, if you promote uh, in question mark promote your experts to managers and, and or project managers you should at least acknowledge that you are uh, that they are probably not experts in the manager or in the project manager skills or competences so you might uh, and and you probably have found uh, out uh, a number of times in your careers that you uh, what you could do is lose an expert and also get a bad manager out of it it's not the same as experts are not good managers at all it's just that they might you might drop them on the driver's uh, level if if you do that um and one finding i think maybe from my own experience uh, I've seen a lot of ITIL implementations where ITIL was taken uh, literally uh, as, as a number of uh, context-free rules and uh, not interpreted um, in the in the given context they were they were where they were needed so uh, an expert imp implementing ITIL would probably interpret the ITIL and not use it as uh, as just some uh, context-free rules. So, sorry I'm a little uh, uh, below uh, time. Um, this is all I have for you. Uh, if we have any questions, um, then um, I'm here for you. So hi Kenny, hi Kenny, it's Neil. So uh, thank you very much hi. for uh, kind of guiding us through the, uh, the thesis you did and, and the challenges and the, and the insights you got from uh, doing that. And I myself have worked in uh, a number of operations teams in, across the years, and I can say you know some of the things you're bringing up definitely I can see you know the things like experts and you know when you pair the right people and, and have that communication channel you know for example you were showing it kind of two branches of, apart and no more than that I've definitely seen that kind of be pushed oh well there's the expert so he can need to teach to everyone so that was fantastic to kind of see that you know it's not always going to be the best strategy to, to try and you know teach maybe one or two levels below where you currently are and mm -hmm. have have it kind of you know iterate down those the, the, the chain effectively. That's, that was very good to see that kind of information. The recording for the session, by the way, everyone, will be uh, put up, so we have this recording. Um, and it, I'm sure that if you need the slide deck from Kenny, we can we can probably get that sorted as well. Um, so I do thank you for coming along today and, and presenting for our professional chapter. It, it's hard sometimes to convey these more abstract, uh, kind of, you know, less technical, you know, kind of skills to, to, to be able to have people come and, and have an interest in understanding how to move their career or people they work with and, and help others do that is, is fantastic to see. So appreciate your time, Kenny, for today. That was fantastic. Thanks. Sure. Good. And have a nice evening, all of you. I will do. And uh, we will see you at an event soon, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.